Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to start in about uh, one minute. I just want everyone to have a chance to log in. So hang out for just one minute, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. It's entitled How COVID-19 Has Affected Transportation in Metro Atlanta. My name is Melissa Roberts, the Community Engagement Manager in the Transportation Access and Mobility Group at ARC. We're excited to have you join us for today's webinar. This webinar is part of a weekly series hosted by ARC to share information and analysis, as well as best practices with local governments and regional leaders so that we can all make informed decisions during this unusual time. I wanna make sure you know that all webinars in this series, including recordings of past webinars and information on upcoming webinars are posted on ARC's COVID-19 webpage, which you can find easily from a pop-up bar on our homepage, but I've also posted a link to that page in our chat box um, at the start of this webinar. Over the last few weeks, we've had sessions on municipal operations, the economic impacts of COVID-19, and more. Next week, May 12th, we'll have a webinar about inclusive community engagement during COVID-19 and beyond. Before we get started, um, and before I get a chance to introduce our webinar and speakers, I want to go over a few notes about the GoToWebinar platform that we're using today. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee control panel. And you should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. <clears throat> Throughout the webinar, you'll have an opportunity, to <clears throat> excuse me, an opportunity to submit text questions or comments by typing your questions directly into the questions panel of the control panel. You can send your questions in any time that you'd like during the presentation. We'll collect them and we'll address them during the Q&A session towards the end of the meeting. You will also see chat messages from us in that window. One thing to note is that for our current meeting, all attendees have joined in listen only mode, and so you'll be on mute during the meeting. But please, if you would like to speak during the Q&A period, just raise your hand or make a comment in the chat box to let us know. And of course, you can just type your questions as well. A few other quick notes. If you click away to another application or browser, you might have trouble finding the meeting again. So either look for this blue flower petal icon in the ribbon bar at the bottom or side of your screen, or look in one of the open browser tabs. Um, also, that orange colored arrow on the control panel will collapse the control panel, so it's not taking as much real estate on your screen. And you can also move it to another part of your screen if you'd like. I want to make sure you know that today's meeting and all of the ARC webinar series are recorded through the GoToWebinar platform, and these recordings will be made available to all meeting attendees via a follow-up email and also posted on ARC's website. Okay, so let's get started. Today, we are excited to hear from a series of speakers about the ways that the pandemic has affected travel patterns across Metro Atlanta, from roads and highways to buses and trains. We're very appreciative to have staff from MARTA, GDOT, and ARC here to share information with us about these significant impacts. We have Heather Aldehef, MARTA's, MARTA's Assistant General Manager of Planning. She will discuss how the agency has monitored ridership and provide observations on the impact of ridership declines on the system. And then Mark Demadovich, uh, GDOT's Assistant State Tra Traffic Engineer will share the department's process of monitoring major commuting corridors during COVID-19 and discuss the impact on commuting patterns. 
John Orr, ARC's Transportation Access and Mobility Group Manager, will provide highlights on new data sources that depict the decline in travel and highlight how this decline in travel may possibly impact the Regional Transportation Improvement Program over time. We're very grateful to each of you for sharing your time and this information with us today. I would like to share one caveat for all of our attendees on behalf of today's speaker. Uh, that this information presented today is a static snapshot of time as it stands right now, meaning this data could and likely will change as we move forward, but it's an indication of where we are today. We will hear from each speaker for about 20 minutes and move into a brief, brief Q&A period, and at that point or any time during the webinar, please feel free to submit questions via the chat box. Okay, I'm now going to turn this over to John Orr briefly before we begin, begin with a presentation from Heather. All right, John. Thank you, uh, Melissa. Uh, it's uh, good to be with everyone today. Uh, one of the items that we at ARC have had a significant amount of uh, comments, questions on, and also our regional partners has been the impact of uh, COVID-19 on our regional transportation network. Realize that everyone uh, typically sees the news and it's obvious that it has had a major impact. So in uh, preparing for this webinar today, we wanted to bring in really experts from uh, around the region to help give you some of the flavor of, of what has happened. Heather, who will speak in just a moment, has great knowledge of the Atlanta region, has uh, lived and worked here for a long time, and will share some of the direct impacts on MARTA. And then following Heather will be Mark, uh, and Mark will has also had a long career here in the Atlanta region with Georgia DOT. And as Melissa indicated, we'll be able to give you the flavor of how COVID-19 has impacted our major corridors. So that being said, one of the, I will be turning over here uh, my screen to Heather, who will kick us off this afternoon. So thank you, Heather. You um, should be getting control of the screen momentarily. Can you all hear me and see the screen? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Um, well, to start, I want to say thanks for this time and thanks for sharing. I think this is a really uh, unique time. It's incredibly interesting, both professionally and personally. And so I'm, I'm grateful for learning from everybody and appreciate ARC for making this happen. Uh, with that, I'll try to um, move along. So my name is Heather Aladef, Assistant General Manager of Planning at MARTA. And um, this has not been an easy task to respond um, to this changing time. It's been pretty, uh, pretty dramatic. I'm trying to shift these slides and they're not shifting. So give me one second, I'm sorry. Okay, um, so I wanted to hit on a couple of things uh, with the agenda, or what we would talk about in these slides. First, I wanted to kind of define a little bit what our transportation system is at, at MARTA. I wanted to talk about the transparency information that's available on our website. I also think it's necessary to put the context of some of the changes that we've had to implement um, recently. And then I wanted to explain the essential service plan, a little bit about the implementation of that and how we're monitoring that service, and then talk to you about the ridership updates. <clears throat> so what I consider our transportation system, it's really important to understand that right now we're talking about a new type of service and we had to really adjust to a lot of safety concerns so the new service our new system if you will for now is the essential destinations plus we also have new ridership and what i i just want to flag that for later conversation that there's kind of people know what what routes were heavy and what ridership was like before but that's changed a lot too due to the type of jobs and availability of jobs and so forth we also have social distancing requirements that uh, really have affected our service a lot, and that's something that I'm not sure everybody is aware of, but um, having to distance people out on our buses and our trains uh, has a big impact on uh, what we can do operationally. We also have a reality that we have to weigh in operator availability, so the drivers that are available to be there, and a cleaning system, cleaning daily. With the transparency, I just wanted to point out, this is a screenshot from our um, main page. You can go to that page and find updated information. And I think it's important 
uh, to stop for a, a moment and, and remember this is about human beings and this is about safety and 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 so we we show our personnel impact and we also show the ridership impact so you can go to our website and see that information it's updated uh, daily and I just wanted to call out that this is this is a balancing act of keeping our riders safe and our drivers safe so a little bit on the timeline here that's kind of uh, valuable for this conversation today. So I just kind of took snapshots from February of 2020, kind of like a pre pre COVID example. And we had our rail service and our bus routes. Those routes were about 110 routes. So that was kind of before. And then March 26th, we actually implemented rear door entry. That was to try to distance uh, the customers from the uh, driver. That's obviously only for customers. If they need, if they require the accessibility ramp, that's still possible. The uh, fare collection also was suspended because the fare box, as you know, for the breeze cards is <clears throat> near the front door. So again, to try to distance people, uh, the fare box collection um, has been suspended temporarily. And um, obviously, if customers are transferring at the rail stations, the fares are paid there. But I think I wanted to point out that also has affected the data. So as, as we talk today about data and changes, it's important to understand that um, we're having to rely on different data sets over time. So again, I appreciate Melissa pointing out that this is a snapshot in time, plus there's different uh, IT and data opportunities and changes here. So it's hard to compare perfectly before and after, but I'm, I've done my best here today. So basically March 30th, we reduced the frequency on our 110 routes that was trying to deal with the change in, in the service. And then March 20th, we had to go into the essential service plan. So that's a very quick turnaround to change the whole system. And that essential service plan boils down into 41 routes, which is a dramatic difference from our normal 110. So I just wanted to show you a couple of things here. The map is not necessarily legible, but it is supposed to show a representation of our service area and kind of the current routes and, and what they reach. And again, it's really important to understand the rail frequency is down to Saturday service and our bus plan had to be based on a lot of factors. And this has been a very interesting balancing act because it's the availability of operators. It's also how do we serve the most essential destinations and what's our new ridership, the highest ridership on our new and kind of our new version of high. And I wanted to kind of um, point out here that at the bottom of this map it also includes um you can find this map online the full size of this map too on our website but the um essential service plan has 40 routes plus a circulator it hits 17 hospitals 22 urgent care facilities and 85 major grocery stores and also 16 of our what we would kind of consider industrial job hubs so that's kind of the the outcome of that service plan but I also wanted to, I included a, a little, an example of a couple of routes before kind of COVID kind of impacts and then as the changes. And I think it's, you know, as planners, you know, I, I pose this as a question, you know, how do we explain the variability on routes? Because it could be different things, of course. It could be job types in certain parts of town. Maybe people have the ability to work from home. Um, also, in certain parts of town, it's a little bit easier to walk if, if the bus route isn't available. So there's a lot of variability that we're seeing. And route by route, 110 routes, it's not the same. And I just wanted to sh kind of let y'all know that that's part of the balancing act here. Um, and, 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 and there is a significant change depending on rail versus bus that we'll get into as well. Um, to implement this change, this was also pretty monumental lift to make sure that the information went out by social media as well as uh, paper-based. So that basically was about 5,000 bus stops and 500 shelters that needed signs to either say that that bus stop was closed or partial bus stop closure. So that was quite a lift as well on the implementation standpoint. And then our task right now is to monitor this change right now. So it's constantly, um, again, trying to understand um, is the demand for extra buses for that social distancing, basically every route that we run, we need to, because half the seats are not available for social distancing, we have to add double the buses or extra buses. So that's what's causing a lot of supply issues for us, resource issues for the number of buses available. And we have to track emergency sick time to see if the operators are available and then tracking the customer comments. So all of that is a um, constant uh, kind of back of our mind, what we're focused on. And if we can add service back, 
we're trying to figure out if we can. And, and as a result, we were able to do that on 427. Uh, so that um, bus map that you saw before said 41 routes, it's actually 42 as of today. But I'm going to go into now what you were here about and you wanted to understand a bit more about the ridership and the changes in ridership. So it, this is a screenshot again from our webpage, so you can go to that and find it. But basically, on, and this is a Sunday service for rail. So keep in mind, I'm, I've got some other slides that'll talk about weekday service. So there's a little bit of different, a variety of weekends versus weekdays. But um, uh, as of May 3rd, ridership on the rail was down 71% compared to an average Sunday in February. For the bus ridership, it's been different. So rail, you know, averages 70 to 80% down, and you'll see some more examples of that. But bus has been averaging about 45% down. And so, and I, I pointed out this date here on on our webpage. It says 419. And if you remember, our essential service plan went into went into effect 420. So I've got um, some. We had to have it rely on a different data set after 420, and I'll explain that in another slide. But on average, by the middle of April, we were down 45% on buses. So some of those changes over time, you can see some, it, it kind of, it, um, it was not as, it was over time, it's gotten the higher numbers down. So for example, March 24th, rail ridership was down 68%, but now as of April 30th, rail ridership is down 78%. So it, it's kind of been reducing over time. So at first, uh, we saw some changes in both the bus and the and the rail, and you can see those differences right here. April 19th, compared to an average Sunday in February, rail ridership was down 76% and bus ridership down 45%. And then you'll see this note here about April 30th, rail ridership was down 78%, and that bus ridership, the reporting is suspended until the data upload is complete. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to explain um, why that's still not updated yet. It takes a while for our software to update because the, the way the extra buses are being added, they're not actually scheduled. They're, we're adding them um, kind of manually, if you will. So the software is catching up. And so some of the uh, data from the automatic passenger counts is not available. So the, the statistics that I'm about to show you are based on a sample of the trips being operated. So Therefore, when you see total boardings per day and things like that, it could be actually lower than actual ridership. But I just wanted to explain that difference. I don't work in IT. I'm not sure I explained it perfectly well, but I did want to try to explain the difference there. But soon when you go back to our website, you'll see um, the bus ridership reports again once, that, once all of the buses are loading the APC data. So one thing we've been tracking too, because on the on the trains, we're also trying to make sure that if we need to add trains to help with the social distancing, we can easily do that. But it looks like it looks like the losses have leveled off. So if you compare April 22nd to February 5th, that's almost an 80% reduction. But one week apart from April 22nd to April 29th, it was less than a percent reduction. So it seems like on the rail side that our our law, you know, the, the ridership losses have leveled off. And this next slide is also showing a similar kind of uh, leveling that we see. Again, this is a sample of the data, the APC data, but it's the best I have for this conversation today. But it does appear that some of these uh, bus losses have leveled off. We're also tracking comments from the public. These are This is showing the uh, comments and, and we had that pre-April 20th announcement and then since then. And then the comments that people were, you know, we have, um, if it's overcrowding, they should call us and we can get another bus in there. If there's, and then obviously a large majority of these complaints were about the reduced or eliminated service and so forth. Um, I did not include the sick leave because I wasn't sure, um, quite frankly, for privacy and HIPAA laws if we could show that, but we are tracking employees that are out on emergency sick leave. The, there was one uh, thing I noticed that I was gonna share with y'all that I'm not sure would be evident but um, this was our typical bus boardings per hour in February. And I think this is kind of interesting and I'm, I'm curious to hear what Mark says about on the, uh, on the uh, street side of things with GDOT's data, but our, we had peaks as you can imagine uh, in February, but what has changed is if you look at bus boardings per hour in April, the last two weeks, 
Um, we have a slight peak in the morning, but really it levels off around three o'clock there. That's, that 15 is 1,500 hours, so that's uh, military time there. So it, it's interesting to me that difference in peak um, is something that seems perhaps unique to what we're experiencing right now, and maybe that's a good um, discussion item uh, later. And finally, I'm going to uh, finish up with uh, immediate next steps or to look at how do we develop other scenarios for adding service back on, basing it on different milestones or different kind of futures. Uh, we still have to consider social distancing and operator availability. So that's really something that's not going away for us, regardless of what businesses are opening. We still have to provide safety for our passengers and drivers. Uh, so that's something that's a reality for us. And then we have to confirm a lot of new information on the funding side. Sales tax receipts um, have developed new projections and, and look at the recent federal support. So th that's that's the end of my presentation. I will um, try to pass it over to Mark. All right. Uh, thanks, Heather. Um, I'd like to echo what Heather said and thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today and give a little perspective on what's going on with the, um, the vehicle traffic on Georgia's roadways. Uh, like John alluded to, I've been with DOT for a long time, since 1990, in fact. Um, so I've been through the Olympics and three Super Bowls and various snowpocalypses and snowmageddons and the recession of 07, 08, and all of those things, but really none of them has had an impact on traffic uh, in our state as much um, as this pandemic has. So it's been really interesting and startling, quite frankly, to see some of the numbers. Um, I wanted to start with just a little bit of a timeline on uh, some of the key dates that had impacts on um, people's movements, basically. So around March 2nd is when the first case officially was, was reported in Georgia. And then on the 18th of March is when the governor ordered that the schools closed. And that included not um, only elementary schools and high schools, but also the, the public universities, colleges. Um, then Mayor Bottoms issued a Atlanta stay at home order on March 23rd. And that was followed in days around that by several local counties as well. Um, and then finally on April 2nd is when uh, the governor put his statewide shelter in place, uh, which lasted all the way until the partial reopening that we just experienced recently on the, around the April 24th, 27th uh, timeline. And then you had the statewide shelter in place expiration on May 1. And of course, beyond that, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but the area highlighted in the red is really what I'm gonna concentrate on is where we saw the the lowest traffic volumes sort of in the in the heart of those um, stay at home orders. Um, I'm gonna talk about three different kinds of roadways, the, the interstates, freeways in Metro Atlanta, and then some of the state routes in Metro Atlanta, and then also talk about the rural interstates um, outside of Metro Atlanta. This chart right here, shows traffic volumes at uh, seven locations that we selected around Metro Atlanta with the sort of peachy orange column showing 2019 numbers and then the bluish column showing um, 2020 numbers this year. And these are 24 hour daily total traffic volumes. So for example, the first one is I-75 southbound, Delk Road in Cobb County. Um, previously had 148,000 vehicles a day and recently dropped to 84,000 vehicles a day for a difference of 43% down. Um, and you can look at those other locations and you see it's sort of a mixture of 30s and 40% down across the board. But interestingly, Georgia 400 literally every day had the greatest drop. Um, it, it flirted with 50% almost, almost every day down. Um, and there can be, you know, guesses you can take on why that is. Perhaps the workforce that lives along that corridor is more um, apt or able to work from home. That could be, that's my sort of my guess. But um, 
anyway, across the board, you had significant reductions on all the interstates for an average, by the way, of 43% down. This particular chart is a single day look at traffic volumes at a, at a location on I-75 in Cobb County. And what you're looking at across the x-axis is the time of day. So midnight is at the very left all the way through the day up till midnight the next day. And the blue line is the 2019 numbers, the sort of the normal days. And, and you can see, as you would expect, a big um, morning rush hour uh, hump where around 6 to 7 a.m. It, it, it peaks quite a lot and then it sort of levels off the rest of the day before falling off at, at night. Now in 2020, you can see that the morning peak is all but leveled off. There there's, isn't really much of one. Um, it's kind of flat um, and stays flat throughout the day. And it's also greatly reduced from the 2019 volumes. And then of course it trails down at the end of the day also. Um, this chart shows the average of all our interstate locations um, through the week, starting back at March 23rd, there was an average of minus 33% traffic volumes. And then you can see it went a little lower around March 30th. And then on the 6th of April or the week of the 6th, in fact, it was at its lowest point, it was down 40%. And then gradually it started creeping up again, up, up um, middle of April, um, back to 36% down. And then once the uh, stay at home things and the non-essential businesses were relaxed a little, it started sure enough to climb a little bit. And this morning's numbers I just looked at were um, minus 26%. So it's climbed even more since I prepared this slide last week. Um, congestion. So what we're looking at here is a map of the entire metro Atlanta area back um, before the pandemic broke, which was in January and February. And you see a splattering of reds and yellows, as you would expect, showing congestion on various highways. Um, this is, by the way, the morning rush hour. And then if you look at the same map um, from a day during the pandemic here, just a few days ago, April 30th, there's virtually no congestion at all. It's absent of hardly uh, any red or yellow. Um, this is the same thing for evening rush hour. You can see back before the, the outbreak, it was pocked with reds and yellows and oranges. And then again, in the afternoon recently, it's much um, reduced. There's a few spots over there, but that could have been an, an incident or something like that. But the bottom line is, from our perspective, congestion on the interstates has virtually disappeared. There, there isn't any. Um, and it's it's just gone down to almost nothing. The, the speeds on the interstate, even in the very, very heart of rush hour, are 55, 60, 65 miles an hour. Um, the next thing I wanted to do is talk a little bit, little bit about the changes we saw on some of our state routes. These are your, your Cobb Parkways, Peachtree, Piedmont, Roswell Road, Thornton Road, those kind of roadways. Um, Non-interstate, but heavily traveled. Um, and we got this data mostly from our traffic signal software that um, is, is managing those intersections around um, the region. So you can see here, these are again, volume counts at various locations, Moreland Avenue, Claremont Road. I won't read every one, but you can see even greater drops here on these, on these state routes, greater than what we saw in the interstates, 64% um, down, 52, 60, et cetera. So the, um, the off or the off interstate roadways um, saw even in greater reductions. Now this is a uh, over time trend chart with with March 20th at the very left all the way to May 3rd on the right, and you can see it's it's a series of a lot of ups and downs. But in general, the volume reduction sort of bottomed out mid April 10th 11th ish. And you can see a little slow upward trend towards the right side of the chart where just things are coming up just a little bit, again, on the state routes. Um, and the last roadway type that I wanted to talk about is our rural interstates. So these are roadways outside of Metro Atlanta 
South Georgia, East Georgia, very far North Georgia, those sets of areas. Um, and, and those roadways are not um, what you really consider commuting corridors as much as they are here in Metro Atlanta. Those are more freight um, oriented, long distance travel, vacation, that kind of thing. So what we looked at on those roadways was truck counts. We were very interested in, in truck counts in the rural interstates. And if you ignore the, the lines, the blue and orange lines right now, and just concentrate on the bar parts of the graphs, you see the grayish line and the orange line. Um, gray was um, during the outbreak and orange was pre-outbreak. Pre so you can actually see that freight movement was higher during the outbreak than it was previously. And, and that doesn't really come as a surprise to me because the, um, you know, the supply chain was still working to get us all our groceries stocked and Amazon packages delivered and whatnot. So, um, I mean, there's a few days that it's lower, but in general, it was right at normal or slightly above. Now, if you change your attention to the orange and blue lines, the, the horizontal lines, that is overall traffic on the rural interstates. And that's um, your freight plus your passenger cars mixed together. And uh, orange is pre and the blue line is uh, during the outbreak and you can see it's much much reduced overall so bottom line on, on the non-metro area interstates is freight same or a little bit higher but overall traffic um down quite a bit just like we saw here in metro atlanta and i believe that's all i have yep so i'm going to pass it on to john So we can continue and summarize. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mark. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I do believe uh, you can hear me now. And um, once again, I'm John Orr with the Atlanta Regional Commission. I'm going to share a little bit of data, uh, most particularly about some of the, the new information that's out that we as citizens and planners can use to help inform us about what is happening as it relates to travel. And then like uh, both Heather and Mark did, I'm gonna share you a little bit of a, a additional information on travel trends since March, and then have a, a discussion on some of the impacts. Well, the first item that I, I did wanna highlight for you is gonna be the uh, information on a brand new tool that has been made available by Google and it's called the COVID-19 Community Mobility Reports. And Google has now released a significant amount of their data for use by public sector agencies on the types of trips that have uh, occurred and how those trips have changed over time. And to give you a little bit of background on where this data comes from, if in your smartphone, you have uh, turned on the location history setting. It provides information on where you are. Uh, like for instance, if you've gone to a pharmacy, it is able to report where you went. And also on top of that, the duration of your visit of before. And so we as planners, like at public agencies like ARC, we've never really had this data before, especially in real time uh, environment. So to give you a little bit of a highlight on one of the reports, um, this is the report for Fulton County. And you can see also at the top of the screen is the hyperlink that you can go to as well and pull down reports for your community as well at the county level. And what is available is like regarding certain types of trip types, ranging over six categories, retail and recreation, all the way down to workplace and residential trips, how that has changed during the COVID-19 event. And just to give you an example in Fulton County, um, you can see that retail and recreational trips have been reduced by 52%. And as Marks noted uh, as well, when he was sharing some of the travel information, we're starting to see the beginning of what certainly appears to be a rebound in some activity, but we can share a little bit more information on that in a moment. 
Now, the, to hit the highlights for three of these tri types of trips, the first one I wanted to share was retail recreational travel trips and how that's changed over the event. Is that right now about 34 uh, percent, we're below about 34 percent from normal for total trips statewide, which is illustrated in the first uh, row. But you can see within the Atlanta region um, that we've seen a reduction of a low of about from Spalding County, about 10 percent to Pike County has actually decreased about 54 percent. And these counties are composed of the 20 counties that are within the Atlanta Regional Commission's uh, regional transportation planning area. So one of the reasons I wanted to focus on this for a moment is because retail uh, composes a critical part of our economy. My counterpart, Mike Carnathan, also shared similar information at a webinar last week. And this is a, an early indicator that we're likely to see some significant decreases in our sales tax revenues that most of our local governments use for both capital planning and also many of them also use to support their local government operations via a host or a lost option sales taxes. Looking at how the COVID-19 event has impacted um, travel to workplaces in the region, uh, you can see we've had a significant event, of course, that's occurred. Statewide, we've seen a reduction of about 42 percent, uh, whereas in the Atlanta region, it's ranged of a decline of about 45 percent in Fayette County, as well as a, a decline to about 29 percent in Spalding County. So this reconfirms some of our assumptions about the impacts of the shelter in place and uh, encouragement to have the community telework. It has had a significant impact on the Atlanta region and the state as certainly as a whole. Heather shared uh, obviously some great information about uh, MARTA's, what they have observed as it relates to impacts on transit trips and such uh, for the system. Also, we've been able to assess the Google uh, Mobility Report uh, to understand, um, and it will not be a complete matching on what you saw with, from Heather, but what they were seeing based on some of their activity data. And you can see that there has been, at least based on the data from Google, a significant impact among the communities in the region that have transit systems, and most particularly on Clayton County, um, which is we're showing, at least based on the Google Community Report, um, about 86% reduction in um, tra travel to transit stations in Clayton County. Now, the second item I did want to highlight for a moment is another source of data that, that's available uh, to both the public sector and also just private um, people. If you're interested, you can also access this data online, and I'll share the links with you as well. There is a, a company called Streetlight that has now provided uh, really invaluable information about how travel has changed as it relates to vehicle miles of travel. And ultimately, what they are doing is comparing what they are seeing against um, actually historic data. Uh, for travel, and the baseline for that historic data is what was occurring in January of this year. And this is another uh, data source that we've never, of course, had access before that now allows us to be able to almost in real time assess the impact of uh, events on travel. Uh, the, you'll see illustrated on the screen is a screenshot from streetlight.com that's zoomed into the core of the Atlanta region. And it's a very easy tool to use. Uh, you can see illustrated on the screen, you can actually just hover over a county. And in this case, I had hovered over DeKalb County, and there's a drop down box that will immediately tell you 
the change in typical travel using uh, vehicle miles traveled as a, a metric, which in this case for the date of May the 1st, it was down about 58%. Now, the, these figures that I'm getting ready to share with you certainly will not match up with what Mark was able to share with you on some of the interstate and state route information. It's a, a different methodology to calculate the data. And on top of that, this data also includes um, non-state routes and local roads. So I'll give you a few highlights on at least what we're, we've learned to date based on what the streetlight data is saying, is that um, if you can recollect, Mark uh, highlighted when the schools closed in Georgia. And that was roughly around that period of March 18th. And then there was some other um, events that happened about the, uh, where businesses started to work remotely around that period of March 20th. So that's a very critical time period to look at. But you can see the impact of the COVID-19 uh, event uh, on the graphic. Um, you can see that we were basically in a stable pattern of travel all the way up until about uh, March, roughly around the 14th, 15th. And then we had a steady decline that continues today. Ultimately, it appears like travel in Georgia for vehicles is a down if you include local roads, non-state routes, we're estimating it to be about 59%. Also, like was indicated, if you can look on the right side of the line, you can see with some of the uh, shelter in place restrictions being lifted, we're starting to see what appears to be a rebound in some of the travel that at least puts us back and now into the levels that we had not seen until back in March. So we'll be closely monitoring these changes in travel behavior uh, moving forward, of course. Now shifting to the Atlanta region, which the, these uh, numbers are compiled by looking at the 20 counties in the metropolitan planning area, is that it appears that such as travel is down about 67% compared to what we were experiencing in March. So very similar story as uh, when you look at the statewide numbers. But on top of this, um, one item that is very critical is that as it relates to the rebound in Metro Atlanta for some of the, the travel, uh, this data just goes through May the 1st. So one item that we will be looking at very closely will be uh, looking at the data for this week. So I think we're very hopeful that um, we'll start to see a return to some economic activity. Uh, of course, everyone wants to, that to occur in a safe manner, uh, but this is also very, very critical. Now, one of the reasons uh, you may be asking the question, why is vehicle miles travel so important? And ultimately, not only is it an indicator of economic activity, but are primary sources of uh, funding that goes into transportation at the state and federal level are directly tied to motor fuel excise taxes. Uh, then with a decline in motor fuel taxes, it certainly over time can not only impact the federal highway trust fund, but also resources that we collectively use in Georgia uh, to address and improve the system. So this is an important factor that we all will be monitoring moving forward during the COVID-19 event. Now, the last uh, item I wanted to share with you was uh, how does this VMT change compare among the various counties? Uh, as I indicated, region-wide, we, uh, based on the streetlight data, we think there's been about a 67% decrease in regional travel, and you can see that there's a pretty broad range of, of uh, impacts, but all of these are major decreases in travel from a low in Pike County of about 45% to what is a huge number of 79% in Fulton County. So the you can see the ranges um, 
many counties are actually in the 60 to 70 percent range and so this will be an item we'll be closely monitoring in the coming uh, period so in closing an important point i wanted to leave you with was that it's almost that economists in fact i think about all economists believe that we have now entered into a recessionary period and during the last recession uh, we did not see um, travel return back to pre-recession levels until seven years is how long it took from 2008 until 2015. why obviously this is important is that we, um, the transportation agencies, primarily at the state and federal level, rely on motor fuel taxes that are generated by the number of gallons sold, and that's directly related to vehicle miles traveled. So one of the items that we'll all be closely monitoring moving forward will be um, how the trends, what the trends are relating to travel. And this ultimately could be a major issue that impacts funding at the national level very, very much so. So we'll be closely monitoring this moving forward. So that being said, I appreciate you giving us an opportunity to speak with you today. As Melissa indicated, uh, we do have the cap capability for you to ask questions. And Melissa, I'll be glad to turn it back to you. Great, thank you, John. And thanks everybody for um, sharing all this information. I know it's been really valuable. Um, we do have a few questions that's come in and we have time for more. If any of you have questions you wanna share, please go ahead and type them um, in here. One thing, um, let's see, I think John, since you just presented, I will give you the first question. Um, it is, I'm curious what, what what you think the pandemic might mean for the future of regional transit investment, saying that the pandemic seems to have spotlighted the value of teleworking. So I wonder how that might inform ARC's transportation plan. Might the plan be amended to reflect what we've learned during this crisis? Yeah, the, the, certainly the, um, I think right now is uh, based on the great information Heather uh, shared as well as Mark is that I think we're right now uh, collectively all still in a period of assessing the impacts and based on I think uh, an extended period of data coming in certainly we're all aware that the COVID-19 event is going to impact some of our long-range uh, transportation assumptions. Uh, one important item, however, is that certainly regional transit is a critical element of the regional transportation plan. And ultimately, we have a significant amount of the, our region was built around accessing our workplaces via public transportation. And mm -hmm. so we certainly, over the long term, desperately need transit to continue to be a viable and heavily used part of our regional transportation network. Uh, Melissa, the other point, part of the question was the impact of telecommuting um, on the region and the impact ultimately long-term of teleworking on our regional transportation plan. That is probably the biggest item that we're aware of that ARC and all of our regional partners are going to need to do an even better job planning for. Um, many of the planning experts believe that the COVID-19 event will do a tremendous amount to continue to stimulate teleworking. And so we just don't have all the answers yet, but that's a very good question. Okay, thank you. And um, related to that question, we have quite a few questions, I think, um, for you, Heather, about transit. So um, here's... A, one of them is okay. how do you think how do you think COVID-19 is going to impact our efforts to expand transit or ATL efforts as we see social distancing is likely to be practiced in the future and people tend to prefer driving alone? Um, okay, so there's it seems like we're having to consider different, you know, the future is going to be different over time. So there's kind of like the immediate future 
which we still have to do the social distancing and balance out the driver's availability. And then there's kind of the long-term future. Um, can you repeat the question one more time, Melissa? I want to make sure I'm adequate in what I'm answering. Let, yes, once, I'm sorry, I was looking at the second question. Um, so it's uh, how, how will COVID-19 impact, how do you think it's going to impact our efforts to expand transit or ATL efforts as we see social distancing is likely to be practiced in the future too, and people tend to prefer driving alone? Okay, um, so as far as the expanding of transit, obviously this financing conversation is an incredibly big deal and get, getting our, um, you know, like John said, we're in the middle of assessing all of that. So understanding the impacts of that, what we have available in the future, that's gonna be a major lift. Uh, that's very serious and very concerning to me. It's always been a shame, I'm a native of Atlanta and it's always a shame that our, our transit is dependent only on sales tax, which is not the smartest you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. So uh, both the sales tax receipts being down and um, you know suspending the breeze payment has, has a double hit as well. Um, so I think that's going to be something that's going to be very much on everybody's minds. And again, the, the future of transit, you know, I think it's going to be coming in stages or waves. Um, as far as tending to prefer driver loan, I think that's a subjective uh, position that some people might share that opinion and some people don't, but I do think there's a little bit of um, information out there that's, uh, you know, not necessary. I saw um, some factors like what's your risk if you're riding a train? I'd be curious what our risk is at the grocery store line as well. So I think we can, we at MARTA are definitely doing absolutely everything to ensure social distancing and safety. The behavior of people though, you know, that's something we can't uh, stop, but we do have um, one of the benefits of having 41 bus routes is we can concentrate our uh, police on those locations as well. So we are trying to monitor and help with that, but behavior is something that's um, not in our control. But we right. have supplied the buses and trains to keep the social distancing possible, but that's very expensive. It's not like we're saving money. So that's an important uh, budgetary impact as well. Absolutely, thank you. Um, we have a, a related question. I feel like you addressed this fairly much right now, but I'm just curious if you want to expand just since it was asked. Um, the question is specifically related to the devastating loss of revenue for MARTA. Do you have a sense of how this will impact transit projects currently on the more MARTA list or even on ATL's regional transit plan? That, that we are trying to figure that out right now, so there's no, no decision on that. Okay, thank you. Um, then um, there are um, question One uh, question is about whether or not ARC has overlaid county mobility data patterns um, during COVID with employment patterns. Melissa, I can tackle that is that that is uh, an item that uh, we desperately want to do as well. One of the challenges, however, is that right now the data is on that we shared today, at least regarding VMT and also uh, activity data is only available at the county level. So we're continuing to explore some options about uh, potentially getting a finer grain detailed data set that would allow us to be able to do that. But with the data available, the lowest common denominator we can really look at is at the county level. Okay, thank you. Um, there, Can I uh, add one thing to that about the the jobs in the future? Yes, please. Um, it, it it did occur to me that maybe we should be consider looking at NAICS codes and and try to understand where essential jobs are located. You know, for future um, planning purposes, because I do think you know we will ramp up over time, but it it will probably be certain job types coming back on versus other job types and maybe there's something to do with NAICS codes and, and understanding where those are concentrated would be useful. Mm -hmm. um, John, there's a few more questions I think that uh, that might be for you about how ARC is sharing um, any information or do you know who might be about the impacts currently on air quality Yes, uh, the Atlanta Regional Commission uh, is currently monitoring the 
um, reports that are coming out of our air quality monitoring stations in the region. And um, once we end up getting into a little bit more of the summer uh, in the coming weeks, uh, we'll, we'll continue to or start to share more of that and see if we can, what relationships and findings we can uh, draw uh, as it relates to the impact of reduced travel on air quality. I think we're all very um, much of the opinion, at least at ARC, that we, we certainly will see a major relationship uh, between the reduced travel and air quality. However, right now we've had a relatively mild spring, so it's very difficult to be able to draw a relationship or a cause and effect um, between the reduced travel and also improved air quality conditions. Uh, but in the coming weeks, now that we are in May, we'll be able to start to see some, some major findings about uh, related to the potential impacts. And um, related to that, several people have um, submitted comments about uh, future potential webinars topics, um, including things like air quality or any health, public health data um, related to air quality um, and, and what we've experienced. So I want you to know that anything that's suggested will we'll take into consideration. And um, we are planning to do this webinar series on a regular weekly basis. So um, please continue to share any any um, requests or suggestions that you have. Um, I do have um, two comments that I think are related. Um, one of them says that, um, you know, shouldn't we be planning for the motor fuel tax reduction anyway, given that we're trying to build more fuel efficient cars that will consume less and less fuel? So what other funding sources can we turn to so we're not overly reliant on motor fuel tax? And I think related although it's specific to transit is a question that says is it <clears throat> is it safe to assume that programs like more marta will have to be downsized due to a battered economy or maybe even arc's um 173 billion dollar plan i and you know i think just if i can <laughs> say i believe you all have already been addressing this this in the sense of you know, analysis is going on right now about what funding sources we have and what the impacts have been and might be projected to be. I'm not sure if any of you want to elaborate any more than that. Please do, if, if so. Melissa, I'll, I'll just uh, add a, a couple of items is that certainly if we do collectively experience a long, um, prolonged recession, um, it will certainly have impacts on governmental budgets, of which certainly transportation is one of those. Um, one of the things that makes it very difficult at this precise moment uh, to be able to give a, a good, honest answer to that question is that we're still collectively awaiting some of the uh, revenue tax receipt information uh, to understand what we know has been a major impact to our transportation revenue sources. So I think that the, probably the best way I can answer that right now is that we're, we are all collectively planning for uh, some reductions in revenues and we'll have to eventually wrestle with that, but we just don't know the magnitude of precisely what those revenue reductions will be. I wish we, we all could give an answer to okay. that. Okay, thank you. Um... I have um John, some... we may have you may have lost audio for a moment, by the way. Um there's another question now for um also for you, Heather. Um okay. is... Marissa, before you ask that, I was gonna add to the funding oh. question. Excuse me. If that's okay. Of course. Okay. Um so I think I think it's fair to understand that we've got to figure out how much the revenue is down, and then we have to figure out from the CARES the stimulus funds that came through for COVID, how much is available there? And then for, um, from MARTA's perspective, we have to always balance out in which of those funding sources can be for ops and which can be for capital. So it's a, it's, it's a lot of questions to answer and to get right. And that takes a little bit of time to figure that out and to identify how that applies to the expansion program. So I think it's also not just how much, but it's also how would that affect schedules of, of delivery 
um, certain construction projects are able to continue right now actually with fewer people. I know talking with the city of Atlanta, some of the roadway construction and paving projects happen easier. And I know from MARTA's experience, some of our cleaning and some of our other projects can continue actually at a more aggressive schedule. But then looking forward in the future of the expansion, we'll have to figure out those schedules as well. So it's a lot to understand and comprehend before we have um, better answers than that. Great, thank you. Um, okay, the next question that we have for you, um, Heather, is is MARTA considered is MARTA considering working with TNCs and or any other micromobility operators to enable essential workers access to their jobs where bus service has been reduced? Yes, and we were actually already looking into that before the COVID uh, impact. So that is definitely something that we have been looking into and are continuing to elevate that, um, piloting some options and so forth. So yes, you'll, to be determined, you'll hear more from us in the future. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Melissa, I did see one item for Mark, and Mark, if uh, we got in a comment about, like, you know, of course, thanking the department for the message signs that are increasing awareness on COVID-19, and I don't know if you've been directly involved with with that effort to notify the public by the use of some of the signage on the interstates and such, but do you uh, know by chance how long the department may be continuing that effort and mark you are maybe muted i'll unmute you yeah can you hear me now yes yep so like i showed with the congestion maps it it really became less necessary for us to post things like we normally do like travel times and congestion incident and incident messages because there just wasn't really much to report on everything was so good. So we basically turn to the COVID or coronavirus uh, related messages on almost every single sign statewide. And we came up with uh, the language uh, for those messages ourselves. But then as time went along and we we're trying to mix things up a little bit, we started looking at what some of the other states were posting and, and borrowing ideas from them. And uh, the feedback has been good. People have appreciated that. As far as how long it's going to go on, I, it's hard to say. Um, but I would say if congestion starts reappearing, we will probably start scaling them back and, and posting more of the travel and traffic information as opposed to the COVID stuff. Thank you. Um, we just had an additional question come in for you, Mark. Um, but they say it might be a better question for local law enforcement. But can you um, answer anything about what GDOT might be seeing as far as driving speeds? Oh, without a doubt, up. <laughs> um, and not so, it's not so much the average that concerns us. I mean, the average has crept up just because people can drive a little faster. So instead of maybe being 64 miles an hour, it might be 69 miles an hour average. But what's concerning is these outliers that, um, the, uh, I think I read somewhere that um, Sandy Springs police pulled over um, or, or issued tickets and, and the speeds were way above 100, 112 and 114 and it's just, it's just crazy. Um, so it seems like a certain, uh, certain percentage of drivers really feel like since the highways are open, they, that's licensed to just go as fast as possible. Um, which is not a good thing. Right. Related to that, there's another question that asked, um, have you, do you expect to see any increase in speed related crashes, injuries or fatalities despite the reduction in VMT? So far, I, that was my gut feeling originally, but what we are seeing is the, the accident numbers, um, the raw accident numbers, not so much the, the serious and fatal, but just overall, is going down right along with the tr with the volumes um so it seems like proportionally speaking it would the, the fatalities and the, the serious injuries are probably going to come down maybe not as much but it hasn't played out really that the um the serious injuries and fatalities have climbed from what they were before okay thanks um and we have two more questions that i see um there's another one uh 
for for Heather and then one I think that might be for John. Um, so Heather, I'll put you back on the hot seat. Um, is is MARTA considering the adoption of any new transit technologies such as on-demand or microtransit in response to changes in demand and travel patterns? Oh, yeah. There okay, you go. Um, so we're looking into that and uh, we might have to pilot some efforts first before we can actually say what we're taking on for sure. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, we're, I, I, I'm not the IT expert. I know we're looking at a lot of those those uh, options. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then I think this last question could be um, maybe for ARC or GDOT. Um, I mean, I suppose um, MARTA as well, but I think it's more specific to roads. I'm not sure. It says, um, have any of the major project timelines to completion been accelerated due to the decrease in traffic volume? Mark, I don't know if you can weigh in on that. I, I'll, I'll tell you from an ARC perspective, um, we do know that several projects or many of them are moving forward during this period uh, around the region. And Mark, I don't know if you've got anything to add on that. I do. Well, I'm, ha I'm struggling to remember which one it was, but I did see an article where a, a fairly significant bridge project was accelerated by um, X number of weeks, I can't remember. So, and we are um, allowing uh, longer work hours for the crews out there. Um, you know, previously we would never allow construction crews to close lanes during during um, heavy hours, heavy traveled hours, but now we're, there aren't any heavily traveled hours, so we're allowed to um, let them work. And I think just intuitively that tells me that lots of things are gonna finish a little earlier than expected. I know that MARTA, some of our cleaning activities and some of the construction projects are able to, to move forward, but um, I think from a planning level, you know, we still have to also pivot on community engagement and how that works in the future. So, um, you know, we talked about funding impacting things, but also how we communicate. I mean, just to create this plan of essential service plan, it was no small feat with nobody being in the same room. So, um, you know, how we pivot moving forward is also impacted by by kind of social distancing and public engagement as well. And so, um, while people might want to think, well, y'all should be able to, you know, accelerate this project, in some ways we're having to come up with new ways to handle this other element of that feedback and that, you know, communication. So. Um, it's it's a very different future, I think, in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. So at this point, I think we've covered the questions that have come in. Uh, before we close, I wanted to see um, if any of you, I mean, all of you have had a chance to respond to quite a few questions. Um, if you have any last words you'd like to share, um, no pressure to do so. I just didn't want to wrap up without offering you the chance. Okay, so um, just thank you all so much for your time. I think, again, um, a very, uh, you know, well-attended and um, interactive webinar. I want to thank everybody who also joined us. If you all have any other questions or want to suggest additional topics, you can just let us know. One way is you can email us at transportation at atlantaregional.org or reach out to ARC staff. Um, you'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours after this webinar with a link to access a recording of today's webinar. We will also post the recording and any materials that we have on the ARC COVID webpage, again, which I posted in the chat box, easy to find from ARC's homepage. And then next week on May 12th, our webinar will be inclusive community engagement during COVID-19 and beyond which might address some of what um, you were just talking about with engaging people related to planning. So on behalf of Atlanta Regional Commission and our presenters, we just wanna thank you all for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.